Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we're investigating the machinery and the magic behind ChatGPT. First, a quick background. Now, for those of you new to the term neural network, think of it as an attempt to mimic, in a very simplified way, how human brains work. Neurons in our brains process information, and likewise, artificial neurons in these networks process data. Imagine a neuron as a tiny decision-making box that takes some inputs, processes them, and produces an output. The output is your answer for this neuron at this time. They operate much like how the neurons in our own brains receive signals, process them, and then send signals out. Each neuron has several inputs, and those inputs could be values from a formula or pixels from a cat picture. Each of those inputs has a weighted value associated with it that indicates how important that input is in determining the output. A neuron can also have a separate knob called bias, which helps control its overall output. To determine the output value of a single neuron, it must first sum up each input multiplied by that input's knob and then the overall neuron bias. Now a single neuron like this doesn't accomplish a whole lot, but when you link all of these neurons together, you get a neural network. And what's more important is that when you run a lot of training data on that model, all of those input knobs slowly get fine-tuned to the values that will make the AI good at predicting or understanding whatever data it is that you're feeding it. And that brings us back to transformers for a minute. That's because a transformer isn't just any neural network. It revolutionized the field of natural language processing. Why? Well, because of its attention mechanism. In human terms, this is like reading a textbook. We don't focus equally on every word. We focus on the ones that seem the most relevant and important. Transformers can dynamically decide which parts of the data to focus on, giving them a unique edge in understanding context. To visualize this, imagine you're in a room full of chattering people. Amongst the noise, your friend mentions your name. Instantly, your attention zeroes in on your friend's conversation, filtering out most of the rest. That's similar to what the Transformers mechanism does. It still listens to all the data, but it focuses intensely on the most relevant bits. This model's design is inherently scalable, then. It means that by adding more neurons or parameters, it can process and understand more intricate patterns in the data. For a sense of scale, the original GPT had 110 million parameters. But by the time we got to chat GPT, we're talking about 175 billion parameters. That's like comparing your local library to the entire literary output of all humanity over all time. But having all these parameters and this attention mechanism is just part of the story. How they're organized and how they interact is what makes Transformers exceptional. Traditional neural networks had layers, much like a multi-story building where data flows from the ground floor to the top. Transformers, though, can be visualized as a vast interconnected web. This allows for a complex dance of data where every piece of information can influence every other piece. And this architecture is what gives ChatGPT its capacity for depth and nuance. Now, remember how I said that Transformers revolutionized natural language processing? Well, here's a testament to that. Before Transformers, chatbots were really just rule-based and used much simpler models. They had predefined paths and they'd steer conversations toward them. With Transformers, the conversations can flow organically because it's dynamically generating responses based on the vast amount of text that it's been trained on. All right. Well, that's an overview of the foundational tech, but how do you go from this technical marvel to a chatty AI like ChatGPT? Well, it's all about the data diet that we feed it and how it's trained. And trust me, it's hungrier for data than I am for Toblerone. So let's move forward and see how this tech marvel learns from the vast sea of digital knowledge. To do so, we need to dive deeper back into the heart of the matter, neural networks. For those already familiar, just bear with me for a minute. For the uninitiated, this journey will help clarify a lot of the magic behind ChatGPT and many modern AIs. So to kick things off, let's go fundamental. Imagine our brain, composed of billions of neurons interconnected in a dense network, each firing electrical signals, processing and passing on information. Neural networks and AI are inspired by this structure. But instead of biological neurons, we have mathematical functions known as nodes, or neurons. At its core, a single neuron in an artificial network takes inputs, processes them, and produces a single output. Sounds simple enough, but when you combine thousands, millions, or even billions of them in intricate, interconnected layers, you get a system capable of recognizing patterns, processing images, understanding speech, and of course, generating responses like ChatGPT does. Imagine the inputs to these neurons as dials, as we said earlier. As we adjust those dials, the output changes. 
In AI lingo, these dials are actually known as weights. When we train a neural network, we are essentially tweaking these weights to get the desired output. But how do we adjust them? And that's where the magic of backpropagation and gradient descent come in. Let's say that our neural network made a prediction, but it's off the mark. The network calculates how wrong it was using a loss function. Think of this function as the neural network's self-awareness tool gauging its own accuracy. And then, using backpropagation, it traces back through each neuron, determining which weights contributed most to the error. Gradient descent is in the process where the network adjusts these weights incrementally, trying to minimize that error. So picture like a ball rolling downhill, seeking the lowest point. That's kind of what the network does, adjusting weights to find the lowest point in the error function. This process is repeated with vast amounts of data. For ChatGPT, it's processed countless sequences of text from books, articles, code, forums, websites, everything. And each time it makes an error, it learns, adjusts, and gets a tad bit smarter. So you might wonder, with so many weights and neurons, how do you prevent the model from simply memorizing the data? And that's a very good question. Overfitting, as it's actually termed, is a genuine concern. If a network gets too good at recognizing its training data, it might fail to generate well for new data. This is where techniques like dropout, where random neurons are dropped or deactivated during training, come into play. It's like training with one hand tied behind your back, and it makes the model much more robust. To bring it all together then, neural networks with their layers of interconnected neurons use processes like backpropagation and gradient descent to learn, correct, and adapt. Each iteration, each piece of data that it encounters, refines it a bit more. And so when you scale this up to the size of ChatGPT, you get a system that's not just replicating patterns, but actually understanding and generating complex human-like text. So I hope this clears up some of the myths around neural networks. But remember, this is just one part of the bigger picture. Let's continue to unpack more about how ChatGPT operates and the colossal infrastructure that powers it. So far, we've chatted about transformers, neural networks, and how they learn. But understanding ChatGPT isn't complete without looking at the sheer scale of the infrastructure supporting it. Trust me, we're about to dive into something that's not just impressive, but a little mind-boggling. First, I'd like you to consider the laptop or PC that you may be using. At its core, it has a central processing unit. This is the brain of your computer, juggling all the various tasks, running your OS, your browser, and more. And then, for those of you who do game or graphic-intensive work, you might be familiar with the graphics processing unit, or GPU. It's intended to render images, animations, and video. Its architecture is great for parallel processing, handling many tasks simultaneously. Now, neural network training, especially for mammoths like ChatGPT, demands a kind of parallelism that's a notch above what typical GPUs can even provide. Enter the Tensor Processing Units, or TPUs, custom chips designed specifically for machine learning tasks. They accelerate matrix operations, which, without getting too deep into the weeds, are the backbone of neural network computation. It's basically how all the weights are summed and added up and processed automatically, and the GPU is really good at doing that, and it can do a lot of them at the same time. So training ChatGPT isn't about using just one or two tensor units. It's about harnessing the power of entire farms of TPUs, thousands of them. Think of it as the difference between a single musician and a giant symphony. Each TPU plays its part, working in tandem, producing a harmony of computations. Let's take Microsoft's data centers as an example, a true testament to the scale that we're discussing. Spread globally, these centers house a dizzying number of servers. Each server rack filled from top to bottom, not just with CPUs, but with GPUs and TPUs tailored for specific tasks. The cooling systems alone are engineering marvels because crunching this much data generates immense heat. The data storage, too, is nothing short of spectacular. When training models like ChatGPT, you're not dealing with gigabytes or even terabytes, but petabytes of data. That's a million gigabytes. And it's not just about storing this data. It's about accessing it rapidly, feeding it into the neural networks at lightning speeds. Now, with such vast infrastructure, efficiency and sustainability become important. That's why these data centers are increasingly moving towards green energy using solar, wind, and other renewable sources. Because let's face it, as much as we want our tech to be smart, we might as well be responsible too, if you can. Personally, I don't understand why they don't build these data centers in Saskatchewan, where I'm from. It's like cold eight months of the year, so cooling your data centers is as easy as opening a window. But it's not just about the raw hardware. The software architecture that coordinates all of this is equally impressive. Orchestrating tasks, ensuring data integrity, managing errors, and optimizing for speed and reliability. 
It's like a master conductor ensuring every part of the symphony plays in that perfect harmony. With this infrastructure backing it, when you ask ChatGPT a question, it's not just pulling from a predefined database. Remember that it's dynamically generating new responses backed by the collective knowledge that it's been trained on and processed with the power of an infrastructure that's nothing short of a technological marvel. There's a common misconception that ChatGPT is just reading text and then regurgitating the right clips when you ask it a question. This is not correct, and I would be plagiarizing those original works. Instead, ChatGPT trains itself on the ideas within the training data so that it can create new original ideas from whole cloth. It's so much more than just a clever search engine. And now we'll dive into the ethical considerations, the challenges, and the future of such AI models. Because as Superman's uncle once said, with great power comes great responsibility. Now imagine you're trying to teach a friend, let's call her Alex, to understand and reply to simple questions about the weather. For some reason, Alex has never experienced weather before and doesn't know what rain or sunny means. Every time you mention a word or a phrase about the weather, she refers to her notes, which is her data set, where she has stored some related words and sentences. Now initially, Alex's responses might be way off. You might say rain and she says umbrella. It's related, but it's not quite the right response to the statement. But with more time and more conversations, she starts forming better sentences and gives more accurate answers. Now, let's replace Alex with a computer program and her notes with a database. Boo. That would be your basic database query system. But we want to go beyond just pulling data. We want understanding, and for that, we turn to the neural networks. The strength of each decision is governed by the weights that we rarely are equated to being like volume knobs that you can adjust on each input. If a particular neuron's decision is too loud, meaning it's too influential in making a wrong prediction, during training, we'll turn its volume down a little. On the other hand, if a neuron's decision is correct but too quiet, i.e. not influential enough, then we'll turn its volume up. Now the magic happens when you stack layers upon layers and interconnect these neurons. The first layer might just detect individual words. The next might understand basic phrases. As you add more and more layers, the network starts to grasp grammar, sentiment, context, and even nuance. To make our neural network smart, we need to feed it lots of sentences about the weather. These come with the correct responses. Each time the network makes a guess, we'll tell it if it's right or wrong. If it's wrong, we adjust those knobs, the weights, to fine-tune the decision-making process. And this is what we earlier described as backpropagation. Over time, with enough examples, the network gets really good at understanding and generating sentences about weather. Now, replace weather with the entirety of human language. This is the scale at which the models like ChatGPT operate. They've been fed vast amounts of text, like books, articles, web pages, forums, code, so that they can understand and generate human-like text across countless topics. In essence, neural networks for natural language understanding act like supercharged versions of our friend Alex. They detect patterns in the data that they're fed, learn from their mistakes, and over time, they become adept at understanding and generating human-like responses to a wide variety of queries. What kind of hardware does ChatGPT actually run on? Well, let's have a look. You know your friend's gaming rig, the one you wish you could afford with the NVIDIA 4090 and the massive amounts of RAM and a dozen CPU cores? Now multiply its power by, let's say, a thousand. That's the realm we're talking about when we talk about the data centers powering AI, specifically the behemoth known as ChatGPT. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Hold on, because it's about to get a little crazy. When people talk about training large neural networks, GPUs are the unsung heroes. Unlike traditional CPUs, GPUs are designed for massive parallelism, a critical feature when you're working with millions or even billions of neural parameters. ChatGPT was trained using NVIDIA's A100 Tensor Core GPUs. These are part of NVIDIA's Ampere architecture and are a significant leap over the previous generation. Each A100 GPU sports 6,912 CUDA cores, 432 Tensor Cores, and a whopping 40 gigabytes of HBM2 memory. And they cost at least $10,000 each. Now imagine a setup with not one, and not 10 or 100, but thousands upon thousands of these GPUs working in tandem. And that's the kind of computational horsepower that we're talking about. Handling a model as large as ChatGPT requires more than just stacking up some GPUs. We're talking about a distributed training setup where multiple GPUs across several machines share the computational load. And this ensures that the massive 175 billion parameters of ChatGPT can be processed efficiently. With massive computations come the need for vast amounts of RAM and storage. 
Training data sets are huge, often spanning terabytes of text data. We're not just talking about a few gigabytes here. Large-scale training setups demand terabytes of system RAM distributed across multiple nodes to ensure that data can be quickly fed to the GPUs and to handle other operational tasks efficiently. Speed is of the essence for storage as well. NVMe SSDs, known for their blazing fast data transfer rates, play a central role. When shuffling through terabytes of training data, traditional spinning hard drives just wouldn't cut it. NVMe SSDs ensure the data can be read and written incredibly quickly. Now, if you're thinking this sounds like it would generate a small sun's worth of heat, you'd be right. These data centers deploy advanced cooling mechanisms, often a combination of liquid cooling and sophisticated HVAC systems to keep the temperature in check. And power? We're looking at megawatts of electricity to keep the engines running. And of course, all that would have to be backed up with diesel generators and battery systems and everything else because you can't have your data center going down, so they're pretty impressive installations. Now, back to the GPUs for a second. When GPUs across different nodes need to talk to each other, latency can be a killer. And that's why high-speed interconnects, such as NVIDIA's NVLink, play a crucial role. They enable rapid communication between GPUs, ensuring that the training process is smooth and efficient. So for those who geek out over the specs of their personal rig at home, imagine a setup where every component is supercharged and optimized for one task, training one of the world's most sophisticated language models. It's a symphony of cutting edge tech coming together to achieve a common goal, understanding and then generating human-like text. And that is the marvel behind ChatGPT's hardware infrastructure. If you're looking for a cool video to watch next, I suggest HAL 9000 and the mystery of Sexadecimal. Spend a lot of time figuring out what Sexadecimal is, where it came from and why, what, how it's different than Hexadecimal and why they made it different. And why I contend that HAL 9000 is also coded in Sexadecimal. Check it out in the link above. If you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative, I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel. It really does help the growth, and it's what I'm in it for, so thanks in advance. If you have any interest in matters related to autism or Asperger's, please be sure to check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Thanks for joining me here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Glenn! Do it, do it!